morning, I want to direct our attention to Isaiah 1. And my prayer is that God would speak to an Isaiah 1 generation, an Isaiah 1 generation. In the world today, in our community, and even in, uh, even in this room this morning, is a lot of brokenness. There is pain and brokenness caused by the decision of others, wrongs that were never corrected, broken relationships, family ties that were undone, the shame of being defamed. There's grief and guilt over past mistakes, right? As Celebrate Recovery says, hurts, habits, and hang-ups not yet relinquished. There's the brokenness and hurt as a part of the sinful world that we inhabit. There's cancer, the loss of loved ones, depression. The list really could go on and on. There are spiritual battles that seem lost, right? Anxiety over doubt and fear. Sin that seems to be in control. Paralyzing fear, right? And then there are the examples that we could give are really limitless of brokenness that are all around us. Bad marriages, lonely widow, an infertile couple, the body riddled with disease, the heartbroken teen, and the fatherless child. And in preparation for our Global Impact Week, our preaching and learning over the next few weeks is for the purpose, I hope, of opening our eyes to see the world of brokenness as God sees it. And perhaps to even respond to it through the restored testimonies that we find throughout Scripture. You know, the beloved, this morning, Christ loved the broken. We, all, we will see some of their stories over the coming weeks, but what captures my heart more than anything else this morning is that Jesus was sensitive to recognize when there was brokenness around him. But he not only recognized the pain in others, he knew exactly how to respond to it. And beloved, as the witness of Christ, the church is to model that same attitude. We are to model that same response in the world that we live in. In fact, this is the very issue for our discussion over the next couple of weeks. If I could step away from my notes for a moment, I would tell you about just a small example, some story that happened just this morning in my Sunday school class. This morning in our Sunday school classes, we gathered together to go through the normal routine. A young lady came in and during the time of our prayer request shared with us that she had lost her child this week. And in that moment, we stopped as a body of believers, comforted, wrapped our arms around, prayed together, and celebrated the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Beloved, there is brokenness all around you. In the pew next to you, there are people carrying unsung, unspoken burdens that we won't notice unless our eyes are sensitive, our ears are attentive, and our minds are looking for those situations, that brokenness around us. In Isaiah chapter 1, there is a major problem with the community of God's people. In fact, in verse number 2, God calls upon the celestial and earthly beings to give ear to his accusations against Judah. Isaiah writes, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, right? For the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. God's people rebelling against the one who created them and called them according to his purpose, right? Judah in this moment uh, uh, was not a first-time offender. They lived in rebellion through disobedience, through idol worship, through improper sacrifice, and even wrong interpretations of the law. In short, Judah was the child of God who seemed to never learn from their previous mistakes, Any parents relate to that this morning? What makes their rebellion so interesting, however, here in chapter 1 of Isaiah, was not that it was, it was not what we might have typically expected of them. Oftentimes, their rebellion was seen in improper or unfaithful religious practices. For example, they were prone to idol worship. But on this particular occasion, idol worship is never mentioned in Isaiah 1. In fact, quite the opposite. Apparently, the people were very faithful with their religious exercises. 
According to verses 11 down to verse 15, the people were faithful in their exercises. They were offering sacrifices, burnt offerings. They were burning the incense. They observed the feast and the festivals, and they honored the Sabbath. And yet God, in this moment, rejected those offerings. He did not accept their sacrifices. He took no pleasure in their attendance, and he roundly condemned their entrance into his presence and turned a deaf ear to their prayers. The reason for his anger, in a word, was hypocrisy. By the letter of the law, they were a faithful people, but their crisis was one of inaction. On the one hand, in verses 11 down to verse 15, we learn of their faithfulness to the law. And yet in verse number 4, we are told that they were a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. How could we reconcile those two statements? Their iniquity was found in what they were failing to do as God's people. That's the simple answer. In verse 21, we are told that this nation once held righteousness as the foundation of civil government. And yet now they were aiding the murderers. In verse 23, their leaders had become rebels and thieves. Verdicts, judgments, and court decisions could be bought with if the price was right. They did not seek justice for the orphan, and they had forgotten altogether about the widow. In short, the people of God were no longer concerned with justice. They had lost concern for the broken and the most vulnerable in their midst. And God took this crisis personal. Their loss of concern for the broken led God to say in verse number 2 of them that the people had rebelled against me. God himself, right? In verse 4, he says, they have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Perhaps the most condemning proclamations of all comes at the end of verse 24. Ah, he writes, I will get relief from my enemies and revenge myself on my foes. Literally, God's people had become God's enemies and foes. Because their religion had lost its practical application. God had redeemed the people of Judah to be different. To be the beacon of righteousness in the land. To be a reflection of His glory. A reflection of His justice. When they ceased to do this, God's righteous anger was kindled against them. Beloved, today the Christian church faces a similar crisis. There is an appetite for faithfulness in our community. Many churches are full, their budgets are bigger, and the resources and books on Christian material are limitless. But faithfulness tends to end where the foyer touches the door. The problem is twofold, right? First of all, we have lost our sensitivity to brokenness. Pain being all around us, we just don't seem to sense it anymore. Pews and chairs are filled this morning with hidden pain. On the one hand, it might be suggested that people are more private today on such matters. That the pain is so deep that there is such a real fear of vocalizing it. But on the other hand, it might be observed that our apathy toward brokenness and our tendency to be self-absorbed has created a climate in which no one feels safe to voice that pain in the first place. Additionally, the church, we just aren't looking for brokenness. We see a person on the side of the road with a sign and we assume that they have made many poor decisions that have brought them upon this predicament. An assumption that may be totally correct, but we fail to pause and consider that there might be another option. We hear the stories of the financially destitute and, uh, and we assume that any assistance on our part will only enable them further. We see the faces, but we fail to consider the person. The reality is that the human race is radically self-absorbed. Is that news to you today? (laughs) Believing the universe revolves around their own person. I am radically self-absorbed today. Did you know that? Of course you did. Stop saying amen at the wrong times, right? But the church, God's people, are supposed to be different. Second, so often we do not recognize the brokenness 
And in those moments where we do sense it, we are often then not moved into actual action. Helping another person, defending their cause, empathizing with their pain. Those things are hard work. It requires sacrifice on our part, doesn't it? Oftentimes the easiest, the least sacrificial help that can be offered is the writing of a check. But defending the cause of the broken, it requires sacrifice of our time, sacrifice of our resources, sacrifice of our energy, and sacrifice of our patience. But perhaps the greatest hindrance to our response is the fear of political recourse. As a pastor, if I preach on abortion, if I preach on justice, the responsibility of government to defend its citizenship, or ethical and moral voting, well, it is said that I have overstepped my bounds. I have become too political. The church is afraid to wade into the waters of such issues as well, and we don't want to be known as those people who take radical stands, right? To be honest, all of this it sounds a little bit like the Pharisees of Luke 7. When a sinful woman came before Jesus, they questioned his prophetic nature for merely associating himself with such a woman. To reach down into the mud, to pull a person out. Beloved, sometimes your hands get a little bit dirty. And in short, the church is oftentimes afraid of the dirt. But just like the people of Judah, God takes such inactivity personal. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus speaks on this very issue so that you knew it is not merely an Old Testament matter. In verse number 31, he speaks of the coming of the Son of Man in judgment. In verse 32, he says that gathered in front of him on that day will be people from every nation where he will begin to separate the sheep from the goats, God's people from those who are not. He writes beginning in verse 33, and he will place the sheep on his right, and he, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, to, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it. To me, Did you hear that? He turned to those who were on his right and he said that they had fed him when he was hungry, clothed him when he was naked, visited him when he was sick, and it took up his cause when he was one of the prisoners. But those who were on his right did not even realize what they had done. They asked him when they had attended to these causes and he responded, Truly I say to you, Amen I say to you, As you did it unto one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Beloved, when we feed the hungry, when we clothe the naked, when we visit the sick, when we take up the cause of the prisoners, we attend to the needs of Christ because they are His needs. On the other hand, then He will say to those on His left, Depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He said, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. uh, Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will say, be saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And we did not minister to you. And then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it unto one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. By contrast, those who failed to meet the needs of their brothers and sisters, they failed to meet the needs of Jesus Christ himself. 
And for this reason, Isaiah said to the people all the way back in Isaiah 1 that the people had rebelled against God. When they failed to seek restoration for the broken, they had failed against God. And so, beloved, so too do we. If we neglect the most vulnerable and needy in our midst, if we neglect the broken, we fail God himself. James would write it like this in James chapter 1 and verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Maybe an illustration would help. During World War II, when the Nazis were bombing London, there was an Anglican church there that had a statue of Jesus on their lawn with the arms outstretched. And the, sta- and the caption below the statue read, Come to me, unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. As the bombs fell, the Anglican church was destroyed and the statue was blown up. When the members started to rebuild the church and replace the statue, they discovered the arms and the hands were so pulverized by the bombing that they could not be salvaged. They could have chosen to manufacture new hands, new arms for the statue, but they chose not to. And so today, the the statue of Jesus Christ stands outside that London church with no arms, and the caption has been changed to read, Christ has no hands but your hands. Christ has no arms but your arms. Beloved, we are the body of Christ. And if the body of Christ is going to move, it is going to be our, by our feet. If the body of Christ is going to hug, it is going to be by our arms. If the body of Christ is going to speak, it is going to be through our mouth. We are the body of Christ today. You and I, as God's people, we are called to pursue justice. We are called to seek righteousness. And we are called to help restore the broken. In order to do so, we have to begin by recognizing the broken around us. The crisis in Judah was a loss of concern for the broken. They were neglected and forgotten. They just pushed them out of their minds. Today, in 21st century America, the crisis of the church is exactly the same. And for this reason, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he replied, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. But recognition is not enough. We must then take that knowledge and respond with action. For the record, this is why service in the local church this morning is so fundamental to the Christian. When you serve in the children's department, you are seeing the need. When you cook a meal for CR, you are feeding the hungry. When you take a meal by Meals on Wheels, you are serving the disenfranchised. It does not end with service in the church. For There are many needs, I know that. But I see no place this morning more appropriate to begin with. But here comes the problem. We have oftentimes turned our service into something completely about us. We serve when it is convenient for us. We serve when we when something we when it's something we feel really confident in. We serve when it is something that we ascribe a lot of value to. Beloved service is supposed to be about meeting the needs of Christ as his hands, his feet on earth. We are God's representation in this temporal abode until he returns and establishes the everlasting kingdom. Let us not make the mistake of an Isaiah 1 generation who did all of the right religious services but failed to recognize the brokenness in their community and to respond to it with the hope of the gospel of Christ.